It begins with a jolt, a fraction of a minute in which the ground beneath the East Bay reminds millions that their cities, bridges, freeways, and lives rest above one of the most dangerous faults in North America. In the early hours of September 22nd at 2.56 in the morning Pacific Daylight Time, a magnitude 4.3 earthquake ruptured beneath Barclay at a depth of roughly 7.6 kilometers, close to 2 kilometers east-southeast of the downtown core. Was this merely a release of accumulated stress, or could it be the signal of something larger, a foreshock leading toward the long-anticipated rupture of the Hayward Fault? The question strikes at the heart of seismology itself. What triggers a major earthquake? Why does one rupture remain minor while another cascades into devastation? And more pressing still, is the Hayward Fault, locked and loaded for more than a century and a half since its last great shock, about to release its pent-up fury? These are not idle questions. They are matters of mechanics, physics, and survival. The Hayward Fault is no stranger to movement. It is a right lateral strike-slip fault, one strand in the complex network that constitutes the San Andreas Fault System. It slices through the East Bay Hills and runs beneath densely urbanized corridors. Hayward, Oakland, Berkeley, Fremont, where more than two million people live and work. Unlike remote faults hidden in wilderness, the Hayward runs directly below homes, schools, pipelines and freeways. Its movement is deceptively steady creeping in some places at a rate of about four millimetres per year, yet in other segments it remains locked, silently building strain until the rock's resistance snaps. To understand the implications of the latest 4.3 event, one must grasp the mechanics of strain accumulation along a locked fault. The crust of the earth is not static. The Pacific plate grinds northward relative to the North American plate at about 50 millimetres per year. That displacement does not occur smoothly. Instead, it transfers to faults like the Hayward, which bear the stress in uneven pulses. Where the fault creeps, energy is slowly dissipated. Where it locks, energy piles up like a compressed spring. Seismologists have long identified locked segments along the Hayward Fault, especially beneath the central and northern East Bay. It is these sections that pose the greatest risk. Stress builds quietly there, often for decades or centuries, until a rupture tears through, releasing seismic waves that ripple across the region. The last time this fault gave way catastrophically was in October of 1868, when a quake estimated at magnitude 6.8 ripped open beneath Hayward. At that time, the East Bay was sparsely settled. Today, the same rupture would affect millions, and geologic models suggest that the next break could easily reach magnitude 7 or greater, unleashing shaking of a kind that modern infrastructure has not yet endured. The 4.3 quake is not an isolated tremor. It belongs to a cluster of seismic activity concentrated within a small region southeast of Berkeley. Less than five hours after the main jolt, at 7.44 in the morning, a magnitude 2.2 was recorded at nearly 7 kilometers deep. Just 17 minutes later, at 8.01 in the morning, another struck, this one magnitude 2.6 at a depth of 7 kilometers. By 8.44, a smaller magnitude 0 0.9 rattled the same corridor. The pattern did not stop there. That evening, at 6.21, a stronger magnitude 3.0 erupted at 7.1 kilometers, followed just 11 minutes later, at 6.32, by a magnitude 1.4. By 10 o'clock that night, the sequence escalated with a magnitude 1.8 at 6.9 kilometers depth, keeping seismologists alert to the possibility of escalation. In the early hours of the following day, September 23rd at 12.20 in the morning, yet another quake came. A magnitude 2.3 followed a little over an hour later at 1.33 by a magnitude 1.1 under Piedmont. Finally, by mid-morning at 9.27, another rupture hit, this time magnitude 1.7 at just over 7 kilometers. This string of earthquakes, all within roughly the same depth range of 6.9 to 7.2 kilometers, outlines a precise cluster. Such tight alignment is rarely random. 
Instead, it suggests activity along a locked patch where stress has been accumulating and now appears to be releasing in fits and starts. What makes this troubling is that the cluster is occurring in a zone already recognized as a seismic gap. The northern Hayward Fault has not ruptured in a major way for more than one and a half centuries. Seismologists calculate that enough stress has built to generate a rupture of at least magnitude 6.8 to magnitude 7.0 if the locked patch fails. Some studies even warn that if the Hayward segment links with the Rogers Creek Fault to the north, the combined rupture could produce a magnitude 7.2 to 7.4 event, spreading devastation from the East Bay through wine country. But is the 4.3 quake the beginning of such a rupture? The truth is elusive. In many cases, sequences of small to moderate quakes precede nothing more than silence. In other cases, they herald catastrophe. For example, before the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake, which measured magnitude 6.9, there were four shocks in the weeks prior, but not enough to definitively foretell the disaster. Similarly, the 1999 Izmit earthquake in Turkey, a magnitude 7.6 event, was preceded by moderate shocks along the North Anatolian Fault. Yet many major earthquakes strike without any foreshock at all. The question of foreshocks ties directly to the mechanics of fault rupture. An earthquake begins when stress exceeds the strength of the fault's locked patch, causing a sudden slip. If the slip halts quickly, the quake remains small. If the rupture propagates along the fault, jumping barriers and linking segments, it grows into a large earthquake. Foreshocks are, in essence, ruptures that do not manage to propagate far. They fail, but in failing, they may weaken the fault for what comes next. The cluster beneath Barclay, with its sequence from magnitude 0 0.9 to magnitude 4.3, may represent such a weakening. Each minor rupture relieves a bit of stress but also perturbs the stress field, redistributing forces onto adjacent locked areas. This process, known as Coulomb stress transfer, can bring a neighbouring patch closer to failure. Thus, even if the 4.3 quake was not itself the start of the big one, it may have nudged the fault system toward it. The depth of these quakes is also telling. At around 7 kilometres they occur within the brittle crust where ruptures propagate most efficiently. Above lies the creeping zone where shallow quakes are less destructive. Below lies hotter, more ductile rock that bends rather than breaks. The brittle ductile transition is the prime source of major earthquakes. The fact that this sequence is occurring squarely in that zone is a geological warning sign when the 1868 Hayward earthquake struck. It was described as a rolling, swaying shock that toppled chimneys and split the ground. Today the consequences would be far worse. The East Bay hosts high-rise structures, ageing freeways and lifelines of water, power and communication that cross the fault trace. Geologists have mapped places where the Hayward Fault cuts directly under schools and hospitals. If the fault were to rupture at magnitude 7, displacements of up to 2 metres along the ground surface could occur. Shaking would ripple at intensities capable of collapsing unreinforced masonry and inflicting severe damage even on engineered structures. So, what now? The United States Geological Survey has long referred to the Hayward as the most dangerous fault in America precisely because of this scenario, a locked, overdue fault beneath a densely populated region. The recurrence interval of large quakes here is thought to be about 140 to 160 years. That window is already closing. The 1868 quake occurred 157 years ago. If seismic cycles are to be trusted, the next rupture is not a matter of if, but when. And yet, despite all this, science cannot declare with certainty that the September 22nd quake is a foreshock. It could be an isolated stress release, it could be the beginning of an earthquake swarm that fizzles out, or it could be the prelude to a catastrophic rupture within days, weeks or months. That ambiguity is the defining challenge of seismology. Unlike meteorology, which forecasts storms with growing accuracy, earthquake prediction remains stubbornly uncertain. Scientists deal not in certainties, but in probabilities. Still, the probability is daunting. The Hayward Fault, with its locked segments beneath Oakland and Barclay, is storing energy equivalent to a magnitude 7 rupture. 
and the cluster of quakes in late September shows that the fault is restless, adjusting, shifting, moving toward an inevitable break. The deeper mechanics of fault rupture reveal why the Hayward Fault is so troubling. Unlike some faults that rupture in long, slow sequences, the Hayward sits at the edge of two competing tectonic systems, the main San Andreas to the west and the Calaveras Fault to the east. This geometric complexity makes stress distribution unpredictable. When a fault system is segmented and irregular, rupture propagation is influenced not only by how much stress is present, but also by the fault's bends, steps and branching connections. The Hayward is riddled with such complexities, yet history shows that these obstacles do not always stop ruptures. To reconstruct the seismic past of the Hayward, geologists turn to paleoseismology, literally digging trenches across the fault trace and examining layers of displaced sediments. These studies reveal that large earthquakes on the Hayward Fault recur at intervals of roughly 140 to 160 years, but sometimes sooner. The consistency of this record is what alarms scientists today. If the recurrence is as regular as the evidence suggests, then the present-day East Bay may be standing on the cusp of the next great rupture. Locked segments are the key. Along much of the Hayward, GPS and creep meters show steady creep of a few millimeters per year. This creeping movement relieves strain at shallow depths, sparing the surface from frequent destructive quakes. But beneath Oakland, Berkeley and Fremont, instruments show something different. An absence of creep at depth. This absence signals that the fault plane is stuck, resisting motion while stress accumulates invisibly. These locked patches are what seismologists call asperities, areas of roughness that hold fast until they break violently. When one asperity fails, the rupture can either stop or leap to the next. And if conditions allow, it can cascade into a much larger rupture involving multiple asperities. Modelling of the Hayward Fault suggests that a rupture confined to a single locked segment might produce a magnitude 6.8 to magnitude 7 event. But if rupture propagates northward to the Rogers Creek Fault, the combined length of fault available could generate a magnitude 7.2 to magnitude 7.4. In terms of energy release, this would be catastrophic far surpassing the shaking intensity of the Loma Prieta earthquake of 1989. Unlike Loma Prieta, which struck a mountainous area south of San Francisco, a Hayward Rogers Creek rupture would run directly beneath urban centers. The mechanics of rupture growth are tied to frictional behavior along the fault. Laboratory studies of rock friction show that certain minerals promote stick-slip behavior, periods of locking followed by sudden failure. At the depths of six to eight kilometers where the September quakes occurred, temperatures and pressures are such that rocks behave in this unstable manner. A rupture beginning at that depth has the potential to unlock a much longer section of fault if conditions align. The 4.3 quake may have been an attempt by one asperity to fail. Whether that failure remains local or cascades is the unresolved question haunting seismologists this week. Seismic hazard models built for the Bay Area's infrastructure planning assume a roughly 30% chance of a magnitude 6.7 or larger quake on the Hayward Fault within the next 30 years. That probability is not abstract. It informs building codes, retrofits and emergency planning. The sequence that unfolded on September 22nd and 23rd reinforces why those probabilities matter. A cluster of quakes at the right depth on the right locked patch is exactly the pattern one might expect before a larger failure. Comparisons to the largest recorded quakes in the region deepen the context. The San Francisco earthquake of 1906 reached magnitude 7.8 and ruptured nearly 470 kilometers of the San Andreas. The Hayward Fault is shorter, but its proximity to dense populations makes even a smaller rupture potentially more damaging. Shaking intensity scales not only with magnitude, but with distance from the rupture. A 7.0 directly beneath Oakland or Berkeley could impose forces comparable to or greater than those felt in San Francisco during 1906. The difference lies in exposure. Today, the East Bay is filled with critical lifelines, from Transbay water pipes to BART tunnels to electrical transmission lines.
What is striking is how the Hayward Fault blends stealth with menace. Its creeping segments lull the public into thinking it is constantly releasing stress. Its locked segments hide their danger until the release comes. And the clustering of September quakes shows that stress is not evenly distributed but focused in patches that may be nearing their breaking point. Geologically, the process is almost mechanical. Imagine a row of books stacked tightly on a shelf, one edge pushing against another. Push slowly, and some books slide forward individually. But sometimes one jammed volume resists, until suddenly the pressure exceeds its grip and it lunges forward, taking neighbours with it. The September cluster may be the equivalent of small books sliding, but somewhere in that row lies the jammed volume that will eventually snap loose. Scientists continue to monitor the sequence with dense arrays of seismometers and GPS instruments across the bay. Each microquake is plotted, its depth measured, its waveform compared against others. The goal is to detect whether the fault is migrating toward instability. While they cannot declare with certainty that a major quake is imminent, the data provide a sobering reminder. The Hayward Fault is alive, active and restless. As the days unfold, Bay Area residents will look back at the early morning of September 22nd at 2.56am and wonder if that was the moment history began its next chapter. Did the 4.3 quake represent just another in the endless chain of minor adjustments along the Earth's crust? Or was it the first warning bell of a seismic catastrophe long deferred but never avoided? The ambiguity is the hardest truth. Earthquakes are not yet predictable in the way storms are. Scientists cannot sound a siren that says the rupture will come tomorrow or next month. All they can say is that the fault is ready, that the probabilities are rising, and that the sequence of quakes in late September has drawn us closer to the edge. For now, the best preparation lies not in prediction, but in resilience, reinforced structures, emergency supplies and public readiness. Because whether or not the 4.3 was a foreshock, the Hayward Fault is destined to rupture again. And when it does, the shaking will not be confined to seismograms. It will be felt in every home, every office and every street from Fremont to Richmond. The Hayward Fault is ticking. The latest quakes are reminders, not reassurances. In the silent build-up of geologic strain beneath the East Bay, the Earth is writing a future chapter that only time will reveal. The question is not if the page will turn, but when. If you found this analysis valuable, don't forget to like, share and subscribe. And tap that hype icon to help this video be seen by others who need to understand the risks beneath their feet. Stay aware, stay prepared.